It's very possible the two short statements that I want to begin with have occurred at your kitchen table and certainly come to mind for most of us. Imagine sitting there and your son says, Dad, I saw on the news a bad flood that killed a lot of people. Why are there floods, earthquakes, hurricanes, and tornadoes? Why are there famines where people starve to death? Well, that causes the daughter to think of something. And the daughter says, Mom, why did my friend at school get cancer and die? Why did Grandma get sick and die? And that causes the grandchild to go to the granddaddy and say, why do people set off bombs to blow up other people? Why do people do bad things to hurt each other? We will be addressing these type of questions in a threefold track beginning this morning. We're going to see these questions answered for the rest of Romans chapter 8. We're going to adopt next Sunday morning after a little bit of time finishing a lesson we began today in the Sunday morning class. We're going to use C.S. Lewis's book topic, The Problem of Pain, and we're going to discuss some of these issues. And on Wednesday night, beginning this Wednesday, we're going to look at the strategies of Satan. And we're going to see all of them coming together dovetailing, if you will, over the next six or seven weeks, Lord willing. When we ask such questions, we see people not satisfied with the answers. And we see people who at one point believed in God becoming agnostics, sometimes even atheists because they just can't come up with a satisfactory answer to these things. How can a loving, all-powerful God allow the terrible suffering that is in this world? And I know secondhand, but it was close family friends of a family that just could not understand how their daughter, who had young children, would develop cancer and be gone within a year. How can God let something like that happen? And they lost their faith. There's no answer for that to them. And we're seeing that happening a lot. We won't study the book of Job. We may have to refer to it occasionally in our class but the book of Job deals with some of those things and it lets us see some of the strategies of Satan. But at the outset, I want to be sure we say from our, for our lesson this morning, from the very outset, there is a price to be paid for identifying with Jesus Christ. There's a price that's to be paid. And along with the great treasures that Paul is going to mention, for several weeks, as we finish this chapter, Paul mentions the suffering that Christians will go through. We will be asked to suffer for the cause of Christ. I had a young girl come up to me when I was beginning ministry as a campus minister, and she says, I don't have the things that people talk about happening to me. They don't make fun of me. They're not asking me questions. They're not, they're, they're just don't know. I says, I think that may be the answer. If people don't know you're a Christian, they're not going to persecute your beliefs or your lifestyles. If they know you're a Christian, it will have an effect for the most part. In the first century, there were economic, social, and physical persecutions, even deaths. 
There are countries today where Christian Christianity is tolerated and in some cases encouraged, but those who practice Christianity are going through difficult circumstances. And there are those that I don't consider New Testament Christians because they don't follow the New Testament pattern of becoming a Christian. But I call them believers, and there's no question that they have a belief in God. And I pray that they will come to see what the Bible teaches them about a belief in Christ and what the church is and all the things that the book of Acts would show them. But there are many people in many places where believers are very much being persecuted and sometimes put to death. It's happening in our world. And so these verses will speak to us and it certainly would speak to our hopeful understanding of the things that are being referred to. Let's read what was read by Joshua a few moments ago. Romans 8, verse 17, we used the first half of that verse to close last week's lesson. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided, this lesson today, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Make no mistake, Paul was saying Christians will suffer for the cause of Christ. Sure. And it's conditional. If we suffer for the cause of Christ, we will then also be glorified with him. And that glorification comes certainly at the end of our life as we have been raised from the dead, as we would enter into an eternal life with God, angels, the triune, and others who will be there. The glorification but he makes a statement that is really what he's working from for this lesson and the rest of this chapter. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, it's true for us as well, are not worth comparing with the glory that is be, to be revealed in us. If I could put that in modern language, I would say first and foremost that it's worth it. Amen. It's worth it. What we are asked to go through is worth it considering what's coming as a result of who we are and whose we are. There's no comparison, Paul says to those on this occasion. The sufferings that you're going through don't even compare with what's waiting for you. And that's not suggesting that it's not serious, that it doesn't hurt, that it's going to be difficult, and there may be times when you will waver in your belief in God. And he's already dealt with that. When we question whether we're children of God, he told us last week that his spirit, capital S, will speak to our spirit, little s, to tell us, to remind us, you are one of my children. And that verse is the segue coming to verse 18 that takes us through the rest of this chapter. You're a child of God, but it will involve suffering. It will involve being laughed at. It will be involved making, being made fun of, perhaps. It may come to a point that you'll be asked to acknowledge him in fear of your life. And it's happening in some places today. But nothing compares to that, to that glory that will be revealed. The present suffering is temporary. Doesn't seem like it when it goes on every day for a number of months, maybe even years. But it's temporary compared to the future glory, which is eternal. And I think that's the overriding big picture, but I think as you come down and look at the smaller picture, it's still correct. Certainly the big picture is no question. One is temporary, the other is eternal. But even as we go through it day by day, week by week, it's nothing compared to whose we are and what that means 
as far as that future glory. And that's what we want. And we live to bring him glory in this life. So we will be able to then receive that future glory from Christ. He makes a statement in verse 19 that most people that I have been around for all of these years have no quibble about what we think it says. I have found a few that would disagree, and I don't know why they would find a reason to disagree. I think they have to really work at it, because what is said is very clear. And before we read verse 19, I want to read to you from Genesis, when God cast those curses upon mankind, the woman, and upon the earth. To Adam, Genesis 3, verse 17, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. It forces us to think about the Garden of Eden prior to sin. And say, uh, Satan caused a change upon this earth. Sin brought a change upon this earth. Everything we're told about the Garden of Eden is that they would tend the garden. They may work in, in a lower level, if you will, as we would seek to show the difference. But after sin, the ground was cursed, and it would require deep labor, hard labor, and it would require the sweat of the brow. I wouldn't be tending to it. I would be working hard against what had changed in that ground is what that curse is indicating to us. So when we turn to Romans 8, verse 18, Paul says to them, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. And he seems to be telling us that like the sons of God, the creation itself is waiting for something. In both cases, the word eager is used. And so that would speak maybe to our appreciation of this difficult time. It's not worth to compare to the glory that's to come. It's worth it, and I'm eager for it to come. There's an eagerness displayed. But it's saying to us, and it's, the word is used seven times in the New Testament, that there's an anticipation about Christ's return. And there's an eagerness for it. And in this case, first and foremost, is talking about the creation itself. Condemned or cursed, if you will, waiting to be released. And we know the new heavens and the new earth that will take place. And the revealing of the sons of God at that second coming. The future will be here. The glory will be just around the corner, if you will. They will be fully revealed on that occasion. Verse 20 goes on to say, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. It's talking about the creatures, no question, but it's also talking about the creation. And all of us, all of us and it are waiting for something to come. And Paul is using it to talk about the present suffering and what will one day be revealed. And he's using several ways to describe that to us. 
He says, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage. Something is holding it. It's in bondage, and yet it speaks to a coming freedom that is important. I don't think there's any question, though, if you aren't sure, if you agree with me, 22 should win you over. For we know the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Something took place because of sin. And something is taking place now that he's alluding to. And some would suggest that this fallen earth, that this might explain the earthquakes and the floods and the fire and the drought and the famine that comes into our world. Wouldn't it? And isn't it true that the pains of childbirth at some point end? I know one person that gave birth to three children, and she says, you don't ever really forget it, <laughs> though John suggests that we will. And that first pain of that third child really brought it back. <laughs> I forgot about this. And yet the joy of the child when born Amen. takes the preeminence. He's alluding to such things here. This text tells us that God is the creator of all things. This text tells us that even though the creation is fallen, it bears witness to the majesty and to the glory of the creator, capital C, and this tells us that even with those groanings taking place, David said it correctly that the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. A newer translation saying something we've heard before. Verse 23 involves a transition. Not only the creation, not only the creation, but we ourselves, there's where the human comes into play. We who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. From the creation to us, individuals, humans, groaning with the difficulties that life brings upon us, and yet those inward groanings are matched with an eagerness for the redemption as sons, that final redemption, if you will. If you're a new Christian or not yet a Christian, a statement that was prayed might be confusing, that we've come together. I appreciated it. I understood it. We've come together to continue working on our salvation. We work on bringing to fruition, bringing to maturity our salvation as Christians. And this alludes to that. We're working on our salvation till, until that final adoption that takes place at judgment when we enter into those heavenly places. Verse 24 for in this hope we were saved. He's pointed to it. He's talking about it. The next two bulletin articles will spend time talking about this hope. But he tells us hope that is seen is not hope. That's recorded in several places in the New Testament, that principle. Hope that is seen is not hope. If it's in your hand, it's not the same thing that's being described here. Hope is that confident expectation, and hope that is seen is not the hope that's talking about. For who hopes for what he sees? It's something spiritual in nature, something to do with the unseen in our life. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. There's an eagerness, but it's patient. First century Christians, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. 
when things are very difficult, we may pray that this come to an end and I would be better off if I would just go ahead and die. We may think because we're safe spiritually in the presence of God. There's an eagerness, but it requires a patience to let it happen on God's timing. Let it happen according to God's will in your life. Galatians 5.5, 5, by faith we eagerly wait through the Spirit, the righteousness for which we hope. Colossians 2 verse 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's not a new concept just written to the Christians here. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? Paul repeats it from two sides to be sure we understand what he's talking about. Paul wants us to think about four things as we begin to close. First of all, he's clearly said that our present suffering are relatively short compared to our eternal presence with God as we share in that glory to come. And the weight of our present trials is light, if you will. It's relatively light compared to the tons of glory as we're trying to discern between the two. One would be light, the other very heavy in appreciation. And third, to think about enduring now this temporary suffering for future glory is that our future glory with God is absolutely certain. It's as if to say, if you're a Christian and you're suffering for me and you're waiting eagerly uh, for it, but you're patient, it also is saying, and it's there for you. There should be reason for confidence. Now, he's already told us that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, says to my spirit, you're a child of God. It gives us confidence when we go through this suffering. And that coming glory makes it worthwhile. It's hard to tell someone that this is only for a short time, and it may be 40 years. We went through that in our study of the book of Revelation. It's going to continue to happen, but it's a short time, relatively speaking. It's a short time. But you know what? It hurts now. And it hurts just as much after lunch and before supper. And I don't sleep at night very well. Even when it's the worst it can be, and that's next week's lesson. Even when it's the worst it can be, God wants us to know that it's worth it. Amen. The glory that's to come. Amen. Amen. And we get our attention there. I had it described in a simple way. I've tried to remember it. I hope I do it justice. We need to close. I've had it related to a person who has a low chin. And the person who said this, it's been 20 or 30 years, but he has a low chin. And when your chin is low, you're seeing here. You're seeing this. It's short term. It's real, but you're seeing this, earth, earth's happenings. Get your chin up, the higher chin, if you will. Get your chin up, and when your chin is up, your eyes are also up. And you're looking beyond earthly things. And you're thinking about those things above, way ahead hopefully heavenly things. And it's as physical as it can be to relate to a spiritual blessing. Get your chin up and see what's way out there and let that be your focus. And if it hurts down here, get your chin up. You have to hit it to get it up. <laughs> to get your focus where it ought to be. And I'm not making light of physical pain. I'm not making light of spiritual suffering. The next verses help us to deal with those. I'm not making light of them. Paul will deal with that. 
but think of that future glory. Get your chin up and see what's ahead. And this doesn't begin to compare with what we're going through. The weight is not even close from the physical compared to the spiritual. One is temporary, yes, maybe 30 or 40 years, but the others forever and ever and ever. It's eternal. And I don't want to let something temporary keep me from the eternal. That's the assumed concern that's being expressed here. Don't let this cause you to lose sight of what's the greater glory, even though it's not so great right now. Paul's being very real with us in these verses. And the rest of this chapter encourage us to think biblically about suffering. Namely, that God is using it to conform and to transform, transform us into the image of his son. And that's pretty great. Do I look more like Christ when I'm on this earth and difficult things happen and I keep my chin up and I see the greater good that's eternal? Does that remind me of Jesus Christ who for the joy endured the shame of the cross we're becoming more like him that may help us keep our chin up think about what's there instead of always focusing on what's here and I say it again I, I want to be sure you understand I'm not making light of this suffering neither is Paul but it doesn't compare. It doesn't compare with that future glory. All right. Amen. Make we sure. make choices every day. And some of them are more difficult than others. I think sometimes we have to get it up here. The verse or two that we can quote to ourselves when we're getting discouraged about the things we're going through. We get it up here so it will find its way down here into our heart, which is the seed of our emotions. And when we forget it up here, our emotions are on a roller coaster. They're on a roller coaster. And when we're at the top, we're fine, but we go down a little bit, and that's when we remember again what God has promised us and told us about what's ahead. And there's no comparison. And our emotions are right again. Things feel okay again. Because we get it up here first. Get those verses in your mind. Let them be there when you're going through certain things that cause you to let your chin go low. And you're thinking only of this place. This earth. Instead of that new heaven and that new earth. If we can say or do or help you in any way, we want to do that while we stand and sing a song of encouragement. Let's stand and sing.